Okay, so for those of you guys that are starting to join us, we are here live from Grand Canyon National Park for our second Founders Day feature to talk about human history. So I'm going to wait for some more people to get tuned in and then we'll introduce Laura Beetleman. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Today is the 102nd anniversary of Green Canyon National Park. So that means that it's been 102 years of the National Park Service here. Obviously the Green Canyon is older than that and that's a little bit what we're gonna talk about today. Going into that human history and I'm really excited we're gonna have Hannah share her story about what it was like to grow up and live here at Green Canyon. So as you guys have questions, please put them in the comments and I'll make sure that I ask them live. Um, and if you joined us for our mule barn tour this morning, thank you guys for coming back. And I'm glad that you guys can see the canyon now. It is a very, very clear day today. A little bit of a cool breeze. Um, I think our high is supposed to be 52. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Laura Butelman. Hello, hopefully you all can hear me. I'll stand back here. Uh, so adding this Founders Day here at Grand Canyon National Park, I'm actually gonna go back into history quite a bit more. While we founded Grand Canyon National Park, Grand Canyon and the people who were here long before that, uh, their history can speak to that. So what we're gonna talk about is a lot of the Inner Canyon, the Upper Plateaus going back to about 12,000 plus years. So people have been living here at Grand Canyon for over 12,000 years, and we know that from historical and uh, artifacts that we have found on the North Rim. And specifically, you can't see it from this point, but if you were to go over to the North Rim and you were to go over towards the Valhalla Plateau, which is out towards the eastern end of the North Rim on, in the park, uh, you can find old home sites. And a lot of times what we'll find is things called Folsom and Clovis points, which are the ends of, let's say, spears or the ends of mostly spear points. Uh, and we find those um, along the plateaus out here, both south and north rim, uh, showing that the people who lived here 12,000 years ago were actually hunting very different animals than what we have here today. Uh, that includes Pleistocene mammals. Uh, if anyone knows what the Pleistocene was, uh, comment down below or if give you a hint if you've ever seen the cartoon Ice Age the movie. That's about the last time that the Pleistocene was. Uh, and during that time we had massive animals. We had woolly mammoths, saber-toothed tigers, snout-nosed bears, ground sloths that were seven to nine feet tall depending on where you were, uh, known as Shasta ground sloths. And the people who lived here uh, who were making their home both up on the rim and in the inner canyon, that's what they hunted. Uh, and so we find that evidence along these plateaus and they were very nomadic. They moved along with the animals. So a lot of times when we look at history, we don't necessarily find uh, those sort of places where they dug homes or built buildings, but that doesn't mean that they weren't here. So when we talk about Founders Day, it's always good to go back to more than 12,000 years ago. And to bring it a little bit more into more contextual history, uh, if we were to go down into the canyon today, I don't know if Alyssa can point out with the phone, zoom in on Phantom Ranch, but you can see it there at the bottom of Bright Angel. Uh, none of the trees are in bloom, so there's no greenery down there to sort of point it out. But just down there, you'll actually find a lot of old home sites uh, of First Nations. Uh, from if you've been down there, you might have found them along the Colorado River, or if you go back up in that side canyon where there's this big wide open area along the North Kaibab Trail, that's actually where there was a lot of farming that was present. So you'd find a lot of farming uh, that happened in there as well as living along the river. Uh, and I think one of the most important things to show about that is that humans have lived not just up on the rims, but they lived in the inner canyon uh, for thousands of years. They figured out ways to make their way down into this vast, giant, mile deep uh, chasm uh, and decided that that's where they were gonna live for many, many different reasons. 
Uh, if you ever have the chance to go to Ribbon Falls along the North Kaibab in the upper Ribbon Falls area, there are old granaries up there uh, that are really neat and are intact at the same time. If you ever go somewhere where there are archaeological artifacts, you always, always keep everything as it is. You don't touch anything. You leave things as they are and please never take anything. No matter where you are, uh, it is not ours to take. Uh, it is someone else's and they left it there for a reason. Uh, and that goes into leave no trace principles. Other things to note too in this timeline uh, is right down below here where we kind of got Plateau Point. We can't see Indian Garden, uh, but I like to point out Plateau Point and what would be Indian Garden further towards, you know, coming this way uh, is that was also the home of Havasupai all the way up until the 1920, honestly, uh, when the National Park Service, when Grand Canyon became a national park in 1919, uh, they were unceremoniously removed uh, from their land uh, and that land was stolen from them. Uh, and so the Havasupai were taken out from Indian Garden uh, and their granaries still exist today. Their home sites still exist today if you know where to look down at Indian Garden. And those granaries are located uh, in a lot of places in the Tapit sandstone down there. Uh, hard to find. You have to kind of be with someone who knows what they're looking for. Uh, but all of that still exists within the Inner Canyon. And then when you go into more modern present day uh, nations, we have 11 different First Nations that call Grand Canyon home. Uh, and I will list those. Uh, so we have Diné, also known as Nav Navajo. Uh, we've got Hopi, Havasupai, Wallapai, Zuni, Apache, Yavapai, um, and then we've got five different nations of Paiute. And I always forget the five different nations. And I think I got 11 in there. Did I get 11? It's okay. I was trying to. Uh huh. <laughs> Hopefully, I got everyone. Um, but each one of those uh, nations uh, has a different reason why they call Grand Canyon home, and has different ties to Grand Canyon. Uh, and that's always important to the story of this giant, 277 mile long uh, sort of crack in the earth, right? Uh, and this place is so big, uh, and there's so much to it, and people have been living and farming and. Uh, exploring this for more than just the last 200 years. Uh, it's been far longer than that. And people have had their families down on Plateau Point, for example. And I mean, like, have kids. They've got their grand or their children would have been born down there. Uh, and this place is really special to so many different people. Are there any questions before no, I? He yeah. He did get a good uh, Zuni. Zuni. I'm sorry. I forgot about uh, me and my counting. Um, Zuni. <laughs> Thank you, Neoma. Thank you, yeah. Um, no, just some great comments and a beautiful day here today. And um, do you mind just going back and touching on some of the types of artifacts that you have been found? And yeah, absolutely. So from end to end of Grand Canyon, so from the beginning where we technically, like if you put in for a river trip on Lee's Ferry, and I'm going to go with the inner canyon here. If you put in for a river trip on Lee's Ferry, as you go down the river, you will find many, many different archaeological sites, home sites, granaries. Um, you can find pot shards. Uh, you can find... Um, Anything that might be like an archaeological artifact from arrowheads to other things, um, such as like tools. Uh, and those can all be found in the Inner Canyon. There is a site where uh, there is a really neat Diné astronomical site that is um, towards the eastern end, closer towards... Um, the little Colorado River area where the, the confluence is. So there's a really beautiful site there. Uh, if you come here to the Bright Angel Fault Line right here, going back into Ribbon Falls, that's a really historical site for the Zuni, in fact. Uh, and then as you continue along, you can find petroglyphs, pictographs, um, even more like massive pots. You know, and an example of one of those pots that used to be here, well, not used to be, it is still here at Grand Canyon, but National Park Service actually had to remove it for a short time because people were going up to it and disturbing it. And this was a really large, intact, I want to say it was about a thousand years old. Don't quote me on that age, but it was it was old. Uh, and this pot had been sitting on touch for, for a very long time. And then as the river trip started to increase, they started to notice that it was being disturbed more and more. And as that happens, that increases the chance that that pot will break. And that history is gone. Uh, 
And at the same time, um, that, that pot was meant to be there. It was supposed to be left there uh, and not meant to be touched. But Park Service, with permission of the um, tribes that they work with here, they did remove that, put it into storage for a short time, and then they hope to put it back to its original place after years of people essentially not knowing where it might be. Uh, so there are things from end to end of Grand Canyon uh, that you can find that just show almost all parts of this have been explored in some fashion, uh, maybe not by the current um, people who live here, but definitely over 10,000 years, a uh, lot of it have. A great point you brought up because Chris actually was asking, you know, if there's still areas of the canyon that are yet to be explored. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to tee up off of that too, with a lot of the different tribes that we found here, you know, was it more along those plateaus that they like to reside or was it in the Colorado River seasonality? Did they mm -hmm. make those shifts and then migrate to other areas? Yeah, so in case anyone didn't hear what a Alyssa was saying she was asking she was relaying a question uh, asking about are there areas of Grand Canyon that have not been explored uh, did they maybe or did people move from rim to river depending on season uh, and there was something else in there but I've already forgotten but let me answer that first one uh, where what was our first question already um just if there's areas that have not been oh, explored. I, I definitely. If there are areas that have not been explored, I 100% think that there probably have been areas of Grand Canyon that have not been explored. This place is huge. Again, 277 river miles from end to end, and then you have all of your little side canyons, or really big side canyons. Uh, and so there's definitely parts that haven't been explored. And I think one of my favorite stories of that is Alyssa Shala, who is a interpretive inner canyon ranger. They, her and her husband did a Pierce Ferry to Lease Ferry all underneath the rim in under about like 30 something days and along that exploration they did it all on the north side they found some archaeological sites that definitely seemed like they hadn't been seen in in a very long time uh, so there are parts of Grand Canyon I think that have not been modern explored maybe historically explored but there's probably still parts that have never been touched and then as far as uh, living between rim to river Seasonal, definitely. Uh, one of the great examples of those seasonal living would be the Valhalla Plateau. And again, that's North Rim uh, to the east of me right now or to my left. Uh, and the Valhalla Plateau is a great example where uh, down in the... I'm just forgetting the name of the um, drainage right now, but they would farm down in the drainage in the delta where this really nice rich soil area where you could farm and you would farm down there in the summer or in the winter uh, where there was a nice open canyon and then you'd move up to the upper plateaus in the summer where it was snowing up. Wait, in the winter? Wait, summer, sorry. If it's snowing up top, they're in the canyon. If it's not snowing up top, they're up on the top. <laughs> It's like Phoenix, if you, you know, if you're a snowbird, that's what they were doing. Um, but, you know, you're looking at 1,000, 2,000 years ago uh, and definitely a lot more snowpack probably about 2,000 years ago. So you're looking at a very different timeline um, or very different weather events compared to today. Other things, too, that are really neat here at South Rim, we have our um, archaeological site, uh, Tusian Ruins and Museum. Uh, and Tusian Ruins and Museum, there's a whole complex uh, beyond just that museum area of um, archaeological sites and home sites showing that people lived here at the South Rim uh, 2,000, 1,500 years ago. And a lot of times we'll look at uh, how did they survive here, even, even though this is a pretty arid and climate where we are, and they lived here year round. They didn't really actually move between rim to river, um, other than probably to gather things. Uh, and we know, for example, pots that have been found, uh, the ability to, um, uh, human ingenuity is, is a fascinating and amazing. And I think one thing that uh, really speaks to all of uh, the indigenous people who live here today, as well as historically, uh, is just the ability to survive off this land is, is amazing. And one of those ways is the, the pots that they would make they would often get clay, or at least one of the pots that they, they found here at the South Rim um, out near Desert View. They got clay from Camp Verde, uh, and whether or not the pot was made down there or up here, I do not know. Uh, and this pot was massive, and when I say massive, like it's like this far around, like really big pot. And you would often put it underneath ledges, just like what you're seeing here. And in fact, Alyssa, if we were to take like a step closer, you would see just on the other side of this ledge, we still have snowpack down here. So, 
So we still have snow on the other sides of these ledges. And what would happen is that the ledge here would create a nice um, shadowed area where snow would melt slower and you would be able to collect it in that pot. And then you'd have water in case, you know, you get into your dry season. And then you keep them in the shade and that water stays. Uh, so really the amazing thing, I think last time we were here, someone asked me about what my favorite thing of Grand Canyon is. and. Grand Canyon is a vast resource that's just really hard to get to, uh, but people figured it out over 12,000 years ago. Uh, and that is pretty amazing of humans uh, in general. And then to see just the communities that thrived here and the communities that still thrive uh, here uh, and those nations that still, you know, this place is and will always be their home. Uh, and it will always be somewhere where they've been able to, or always be something that, uh, if we just look hard enough and we figure it out, we can, you know, this land has a lot to offer. The plants, everything around here. Great. Yeah. So before we switch over um, to hear from Hannah, there was a question that came through from Judith. Do you mind speaking to a little bit of some of maybe the plants or the types of agriculture that we've seen the tribe mm -hmm. grow here? Yeah, so uh, Alyssa was asking about, thank you Judith for your question, about asking um, some of the different plants or agriculture. Uh, so first of all, almost everything in this forest that we see around here at the South Rim, uh, this pine tree, for example, so this is a pinion pine. Uh, this has got some, I mean, everything about it. There's many different uses for pinion pine. I think one of the classic examples, and this isn't a good example of the one, but I was looking to see if there was any like uh, pine, uh, pine cones around because they produce something called a pine nut. Uh, about every six maybe five seven years it's pretty amazing what forests will do the like a lot of times there's a great book called braiding sweetgrass um but that i really recommend for anyone who's interested in ecological um background on things especially if you want to learn about indigenous knowledge uh of forest and one of the great things i remember learning in this book is talking about how forest systems will talk to each other and things like p pine nuts will do these ma or pinion trees will do these mass drops of of pine nuts for this example or of their their food source and they'll sort of talk to each other and they'll do it all in one go and scientists today western scientists still haven't figured out why but they do know that when that happens uh that happened last year and people uh of the first nations of this area will come around and collect those pine nuts as part of tradition um creating salves food uh also, and in fact, I bet Hannah probably might be able to speak better to what all of the different uses are. <laughs> um, and then one other plant I'll point out too, because it's just here, is our yucca. Um, that's another really great plant. Uh, and that's this one. Here, we'll just walk. Uh, <laughs> and that is a really great yucca uh, um, area. And this one has so many different resources. You can actually eat the tubers or the roots, uh, what we consider not the roots themselves, but the tubers that are down below. Uh, this whole plant can be used from, from root to stem uh, and has been used for thousands of years to do several, several different things. And again, I recommend braiding sweetgrass uh, for anyone who's interested in ecological um, information about plants. Great. Okay. I'm going to, we're going to transfer the mic to Hannah. I'm just going to step back down over here though. Um, and so really quick, before we introduce Hannah, I just want to give a shout out to a lot of our followers here. Um, so thank you from Cindy from Ohio for watching. Um, I think I saw Marie Buck has joined us and D, um, Darren Geiger and David from Wichita, Kansas. Um, you guys know, I always love to see everywhere. You guys are checking out our live broadcast from and I think Roberta from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Thank you guys all so much for joining us on this Founders Day. And so we are going to bring Hannah in. All right. Hi, Hannah. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hannah Littleboy. And, um, you know, like for Founders Day, you know, this, like what we're celebrating today, this is what I call my home here. Um, I grew up here uh, pretty much just I was here a few days old um, so I was not born here but almost um, and I grew up here uh, as many of you might may or may not know there is a full K through 12 uh, Grand Canyon school here and I went to school here and graduated here um, behind El Tavar porch um, 
nowadays uh, they don't have the the graduation there anymore it's now at the McKee Amphitheater but um, it was a it was a momentum moment uh, to be able to to graduate there um, how many people were in your graduating class <laughs> yeah so my graduating class uh, was 13 <laughs> Yeah, so all of us, um, we basically all grew up together. Um, I remember being in elementary school, and we had a bigger class, like 18 to 20 kids. Um, and then, you know, they moved on, uh, families moved on, and just the 13 of us hung out and all graduated together. So we have a really close uh, bond, I guess, and friendship um, just because of that. <laughs> So is your family still here at the canyon for the most part? Yeah, so um, my dad is still here. Uh, he works for the bus shuttle buses, Paul Revere. Um, my mom lived here, was here for a long time. She moved to Iowa now. Um, she was actually the only hairdresser here in the park for um, most of her career. And then she actually put up her scissors and started working for Grand Canyon Conservancy. And that's... Uh, kind of how I got into following of coming to work here. Was from your mom? Yeah. <laughs> yep. So what are some of the traditions that maybe Laura talked about? Is any of that from growing up here using pinion pines or yucca roots? Um, you know, I know traditionally that they do um, use all these resources here. Um, you know, like Laura touched on, you know, the pinion tree. Um, right over here next to us um you know we they use the sap uh they use the sap for almost like ointment or almost as a antibiotic or a topical um and you know the like she said the pinion nuts um now we just eat them and um we sell them um if people want to buy them um that's basically what we use and as far as yucca plants, um, same thing. They use um, they use everything of that plant. Um, if you dig into the bottom of the root of the yucca plant, you can actually um, it's a shampoo. Um, you can wash your hair with it. It's very sudsy. Um, and if you just you break the root, take a section of it, you just rub it together with water. Um, it becomes very lathery, and you can wash your hair. Um, and it's very not, it's very good for your hair too. <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah. Um, the, a pine nut and a pine cone yeah. an example. <laughs> a pine nut's been eaten. Yeah. So if you see there, the the pine nut is inside the pine cone, um, and there's a shell, and you crack the shell, kind of like a sunflower seed, and then there's a nut inside that is edible. Um, you can eat them raw, um, but if you eat a bunch of them raw, you can sometimes get an upset stomach. Um, so usually people roast them, and typically just roasting them um, in a pan or in the oven with some salt um, kind of gives it like a sunflower seed. So. Wait, I'm going to have you step so we can get a little bit more of that canyon in the background. Yeah. Um, so what other traditions do you have with your family as far as with the Grand Canyon? I know you said you have that tight community of 13 of you that graduated. <laughs> you know, do you guys like to go on rim walks together or barbecues? What is life like here? <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, we always say that the, the Grand Canyon was our backyard. Um, and we were always just, we weren't always here at the rim doing stuff, but we would always just be somewhere out in our backyard, literally. Um, yeah, doing barbecues or just hanging out. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it, just a real connection just with the Grand Canyon and growing up here and living here. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing your story. And I think it's you know, it's such a unique experience to one thing grow up in a national park and then obviously Grand Canyon. Um, and so we really appreciate you sharing it. It's so it's great information. Um, anything else that you want to people maybe know about you? Um, you know, I'm a third generation here. Um, my, gr my grandparents um, showed up here, started working here. Uh, my grandmother, she worked, started working at the Bright Angel Fountain. 
and then she moved on to working for the tour buses. Um, she drove tour bus, and her daughters kind of did the same thing, worked at the fountain or worked at the worked for tour buses or taxi drivers. Um, and as well as my grandfather, he was a tour bus driver, so um, I guess the tour and helping visitors has kind of always been in the family. Um, and like I said, my, my mother uh, graduated here as well, um, and she was, a hair, she was the hairdresser for a while. Um, and then my dad, my dad showed up here. Um, he started working at, uh, if anyone knows, the general store, it used to be Babbitt's. Um, he, was the, he was working in the deli. Um, and uh, then he moved on to working at the public garage, which was back then known as Fred Harvey. Um, and he was a mechanic there for a long time. And then he moved over to Paul Revere. Um, and then for me, my first job was at uh, Market Plaza, the general store. Um, they had just changed over from Babbitt's. And that was my very first job. Um, I was a stalker and then I worked for the park service for um, a few years as a park aide and then essentially uh, went to school, went to college uh, for a little bit and then back here again and now I'm still continuing to work here for Grand Canyon Conservancy. So We are very happy to have you, <laughs> see with you and Laura Bull. Um, so this question came in from Melissa and it is really great and I think it's a great way to kind of summarize what we've talked about today. So to you specifically, what does Green Canyon as your home mean to you and what do you want visitors to, to know about the people who call the canyon home? Um, yeah, so you know, to reiterate what Alyssa just asked, um, she asked, you know, what, how do I interpret the Grand Canyon being home and what do I want visitors to understand about um, this being a home and um, you know I it really makes you put things in perspective and makes you feel grateful for being in such a you know nowadays not so remote but um, you know and the fact that people can actually come up here and we we allow that and they can enjoy the park um, and you know just to, while you're here if visitors are here you know just to respect that it is someone it is home to a lot of people we do have a community here and you know just to ve just appreciate it and uh, leave no trace you know that's a big thing um, we just want you to enjoy enjoy this grand park and you know that's about it. Great. Do you mind just, um, for people that maybe just aren't familiar, just reiterating again, leave no trace. I think Laura did a great job at bringing it up and it's never something that we can talk about enough. So do you mind sharing it? Yeah. Uh, so leave no trace um, is just basically, you know, if you, you know, ha decide to have a picnic here on the rim, um, just picking up all your trash when you're done and just, you know, leave it almost better than when you ca came here. And, um, you know, we appreciate everyone. I know a lot of the community comes out and picks trash up a lot. Um, so yeah, just leaving it a better, um, place is basically leave no trace. Thank you so much. You've done an awesome job. And, um, again, we're just so thrilled <laughs> that you're able to share your story with us. Yeah. So any other last thoughts today? Um, no, I just want to thank uh, you, Alyssa, um, for just allowing me to talk. It's always fun now that I'm, I've kind of done this twice now to just talk with people um, wherever they may be. Um, and just, you know, if you're able to come visit, um, pop in the stores and say hi. <laughs> Great. Okay. I'm going to step back over so you guys can see the canyon. And then I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit. Um, about some of the work that we're doing here to really help continue to strengthen this commitment that we have to the tribal and the cultural connection here. And so let me turn around. Okay, so one of, I'll take this off. 
Okay, so one of the big projects that we are working on as Green Canyon Conservancy, and thanks to you guys and your ongoing support and engagement, is this tribal cultural heritage site over at Desert View. So Desert View is the east entrance to Grand Canyon National Park, and right now it is currently closed to help protect the Navajo Nation from the COVID impacts. And once things are safer and we're able to, we're going to begin construction over there on what we call phase two. And it's not to enhance it, it's to help make it more accessible. We really want to be able to have a space for the different tribes to come to share their crafts and to share their history in a place that is able for anyone to come and enjoy it. And so this means a, you know, enhanced amphitheater, um, more pathways that are paved so anyone can get out there, whether you are in a wheelchair or you have a stroller, and also being able to have different sites where they can show their crafts. So Desert View is a huge part of what Grand Canyon's priority projects are, especially going in for 2021 as well as it's gonna go well into 2022. Um, phase one, we did an outstanding amount of mural conservation work uh, within the watchtower itself. So if you comment below, I'd love to know if anyone's actually been in Desert View Watchtower um, and been able to experience and see the murals in there because they are beautiful. And that work was done because wind and water have just taken their toll. And so we got that all stabilized and now we're really ready to make that outside exterior match and really pay tribute again to a lot of the people who've called Canyon home for thousands of years. So today we actually have a giving day going on. If you make a donation to Grand Canyon Conservancy, it um, we have a generous donor that's gonna match up, make $100 for every gift. Um, and that is one of the big projects that we're really excited to make sure that is done and that we have this space. So I wanna say thank you guys so much for watching. So this afternoon, you are not done with me yet. We are gonna be back at three o'clock. Um, we're gonna actually go over more towards the west side. Um, over by Trail View Overlook, so that way you guys can see Bright Angel Trail. And we're going to talk a little bit about the village itself and what it means for now Grand Canyon National Park being here for 102 years and what it's like to be a ranger. So I want to give a huge shout out to Laura and to Hannah for joining us today. And of course, to all of you guys who are my favorite audience because you guys hang out with us all the time. So let's give you the view that you came for. And if you guys have any final questions, let us know. I'm gonna scroll back and see. Um, Diana Cox, thanks you for watching today. Trish Murray, it's always such a pleasure to see you. Judith, thank you. I'm so glad you're enjoying the live sessions. And Sabine, thank you for joining as well. And if I missed anyone, please know that I see you and that I really, really appreciate you guys. And it's because of you and your ongoing, ongoing engagement that I am able to come up here and do these presentations as often as we do. So we are two for two on Founders Day. We'll see you guys again at 3 p.m. Have a good one.